what's happened here? <laughs> Is that how you want it?
Good morning. We're going to make a start. And I'm turning my phone off to set an example to everyone else. I can leave it on for that purpose, of course, just to make sure that I can show you what to do. Um, so can you turn off your laptops? Fibrillators? No. Very good to see everyone. And a warm welcome to St. Mar St. Paul's this morning. Someone else want to do this? My name's Dan McGowan. I'm the vicar here of St. Paul's. And I've been here for six years. <laughs> Nearly s coming up to seven, probably. <laughs> and we always get claps when I speak, so get ready. Or alleluia, when I say something, anything. Um, you've been given a little handout for the sermon. Don't get carried away with that, I did. So put it to one side, you won't really need it until you go home. I've actually just been looking at it this morning and realized I've missed a couple of things, which is a bit frustrating. Um, but you always do, don't you, in the Bible, it's full. The Bible is full, and um, we can only do our best. Uh, by the grace of God. Um, I'm going to pray as we begin, and then we'll... Um, then we'll say something together. Great and marvellous are your deeds, O Lord Almighty. Just and true are your ways. Father, we thank you for gathering us today. We gather in your name. We come to you. We worship before you. And we ask, Lord, humbly, that as we gather, you will reveal your righteousness to us. Because you are just, you are true in all your ways, O oh Lord. And as you gather us, Lord, we pray that not only will you be knitting our hearts to your heart, but also, Lord, that you'll be knitting our hearts to one another. And we ask that, Lord, for the glory of your name. Amen. Well, who thinks that prayer works? Who thinks that prayer works? Right, that's not bad. Um, 75%, maybe 76%, that's good. Pleased about that. Um, does God hear us? Well, you've already done that. So, yeah. Well, today, in part, we're thinking about the praying church amid tribulation, amid much difficulty. We're in Revelation, we're in the last book of the Bible, and the vision in Revelation is of heaven, of God's throne room. And um, can I just ask, um, James, can you put the next slide up? Um, yeah. So there's a sensor. It's a container that holds sort of burning coals. You pop them in the top there, and the incense gives off this pungent smell and the smoke, and it rises up, and it's meant to represent the prayers of the people. It's not the prayers. It's just smoke coming out of a pot. But it represents the prayers of the people. And um, in these verses, it says, I, I saw the seven angels who stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Another angel who had a golden censer came in and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer. So there's a lot of incense in there. Imagine that's a massive pot. And with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. So all the saints' prayers are in there. And the smoke, verse 4, of the incense together with the prayers of the saints went up before God from the angel's hand. And then the angel took the censer, he filled it with the fire from the altar, and hurled it, through it, onto the earth. And there were some peals of thunder, rumblings, flashings of lightning, and an earthquake. So did you notice there, according to this chapter in Revelation, chapter 8, the prayers of the Christians are heard in heaven's, uh, in God's throne room, in heaven. Isn't that brilliant? It's so encouraging to me this week when I've been looking at the Bible. 
Um, and in this particular case, it's a prayers often for justice. So we read in chapter 6 that the people are crying out for help. How long, O oh Lord? How long? Please help us. Please send our enemies away. Please come and establish your throne. And incredibly, verse 5, the angel shows us that these prayers are being answered because he, sh he throws down the results onto earth. So God has heard the prayers of the faithful and he acts against the world that's persecuting his people. Ooh, heavy stuff, isn't it? So we're going to look at that today. And the young people are looking at sheep and goats. So kings and nations tremble at his voice. This is a big God that we worship. All creation rises to rejoice. Behold our God, people of St. Paul's, dear friends, brothers and sisters. Behold our God. He is seated on his throne, listening to our prayers. So let's come and adore him. So when the music starts, let's stand and sing.
our wonderful God. We adore you. We thank you so much for all you are to us. We thank you for the Lord Jesus who is worthy to receive all honor, power, glory, and might. Father, we thank you for bringing us here to worship his name in the sound of our brothers and sisters. In Jesus' name, amen. Do take a seat. And we're coming, when we stand in the presence of our almighty God, when we walk with him, when we talk to him, we know that we're sinners. We realize that we've messed up. When uh, Peter, uh, when Jesus did that miraculous uh, catch of fish, when he threw the net on the other side, when he told them to throw the net on the other side, Peter said, get away from me, Lord. Away from me. I am not worthy. I'm a sinful man. So we do need to come to God uh, regularly to confess our sins. Uh, the Bible says, we all like sheep have gone astray. Meh. Is that you? Yeah. We all, meh. All right, that's the last sheep noise for a bit. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. We've all done that, haven't we? We've all walked away from Jesus. And we've done it today, actually, in our attitudes and in our words. So we're going to say this prayer of sorry, of confession. So I'm going to, we're going to put it on the screen, and we're going to pray this together. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have wandered and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things that we ought to have done. And we have done those things that we ought not to have done. And there is no health in us. But you, O Lord, have mercy upon us sinners. Spare those who confess their faults. Restore those who are penitent according to your promises declared to mankind in Jesus, Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may live a disciplined, righteous, and godly life to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Restore those who are penitent, who come back with, with hearts that are really sorry. And we ask that he would enable us to live a disciplined, a life of discipleship uh, in living for him. And we do that, we just prayed for his sake, his glory. Wonderful. Well, the Bible then goes on to say, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him. Who's the him? Who's, who's taken all our sins? The Lord has laid on Jesus, the good shepherd, the iniquity, the sin of all of us. So wonderfully, we come in confidence when we confess our sins because we trust in the blood of our Savior. Loving Father, we thank you. We rejoice. We praise your name that you pardon and forgive all who truly say sorry and sincerely believe your holy gospel turning away from our sins and turning to you. So, Lord, we pray that you would grant us true repentance and your Holy Spirit, that we may do those things, living a godly, righteous life, a holy life, and that we may come at the last to your everlasting joy, your glory, as you have promised us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Just going to check this is working. Um, now, I just wanted to ask the young people before we um, sang a song. Are you ready to sing a song? Are those tattoos, Benjamin? Did mummy say that's okay? Did the man in the tattoo parlour say that's okay? That you looked over 18? So, before we sing, I just ask you, do you remember, especially Sparklight, did you, what did you study last week in the Bible? Do you remember what you looked at? Shall I give you a clue? Oh, Reuben knows. 
I think it's uh, Jacob's Ladder. Brilliant, Jacob's Ladder. Jacob's Ladder. And, and does anyone, can anyone tell me just a little bit about what was going on? Where was, why was Jacob, was he, was he in bed at home asleep? No. Oh, where was he, Ben? I don't know. You don't know. <laughs> but he wasn't at home, was he? Because you went looking for him, he wasn't there. Do you remember? Where was Jacob? <laughs> Patrick knows. Where was Jacob, Patrick? He was fleeing from Esau so um, that he wouldn't lose his own life. Um, and he had a dream about angels going up on Jacob's ladder. Fantastic, yeah. So he was on the run. Um, Jacob was a bit of a twister. In fact, that's what his name means. He's on the run. And um, things have gone a bit wrong, haven't they? He's stolen his brother's blessing. And the world is looking a bit grim. And um, we're thinking as Bible readers, is God going to... What about his promises? Now, he promised that through uh, Jacob and Esau, uh, Isaac and Abraham, that his promises to the whole world to bless us um, would, would occur. But if Jacob's on the run and he's in trouble, what's going to happen to God's promises? Does anyone remember? What happened to God's promises? Maybe the dream helped. Uh, Reuben, have a go. He got... Uh, God answered the blessing, the prayer. Yeah. So God told him in the dream that the promises would continue. The blessing. He would bless the people. He would bless Jacob, even though Jacob was a bit of a twister, a bit of a, a, bit of a rat bag at times. Yeah, so whatever was going on, God said, I will um, bless you. Despite all the turmoil, despite how things seem, life is going to be all right. Everything's going to turn out Okay. And that's our theme at the moment as we're studying the book of Revelation. That God is saying everything's going to be all right. And we say, why, Lord? Why? And it's because God is on his throne. He's in charge of it all. And he has a wonderful plan. And it's a plan to prosper us, to to bless us, and to bless us forever. So we're going to sing about that. Oh, I forgot about my painting. Um... Yeah, sorry about that. Um, it was the best I found, actually. But you get the idea, don't you? Jacob's asleep, his pillow is a rock, and he doesn't deserve it, but he gets this view of heaven. And often people think that um, the route to heaven, we've got to climb a ladder or a staircase, we've got to be good. But actually, heaven comes down to us. Jesus came to us and says, I love you. So we're going to sing. And we're going to sing a wonderful song. Now, it's, it's quite new to us. It's called Father, You Are King in Heaven and Greater Than Us All. And that could have been sung by Jacob. Everything is in your hands from huge right down to small. Sometimes I forget that I can't do things on my own. You like that? I am. Please now help me pray to you and trust in you alone. So that's our song. There are some actions, and I'm going to make them up as we go along. (laughs) So if you're embarrassed by your vicar making a fool of himself at the front, then come and join me, and um, the more people at the front, the less embarrassing it becomes. It's like like the first dance at a wedding. Right. When the music starts, we're going to stand.
Somebody take a seat. It's like an earthworm trying to do a press-up. I've actually, they do a lot of press-ups, so they just don't come up again, do they? Um, well, well done. You were great potatoes, some of you, then. Um, I was very impressed. But remember the words. Look, um, it's ridiculous. That's what the song is saying. It's ridiculous if we try and do things in our own strength. Uh, we've got to keep trusting in the Lord, keep praying. And that's our faith, isn't it? To f- in order to have faith, we pray. We act on what we believe and ask God to sort it out. Well, we're going to go to our groups. And I'm going to pray as we go. And if you don't want to go to your groups, that's fine. You can stay in here, but um, it would be great fun down the side and in the hall at the back. Our loving God, we thank you so much for our young people. Thank you for their press-ups and potato worms and all that stuff. Thank you for the joy of uh, calling you our friend and our saviour and our Lord. Father, we do pray that as we uh, meet together next door and in here, that we'll be learning more about your wonderful love for us and that we would trust you more and more. In Jesus' name, amen. So, creche, uh, babies and preschoolers, sparklights, primary school children, back in the hall, and laser meeting today. Um, those in year seven and above, uh, bring, bring a Bible if you're in laser. Bring a Bible and bring it back. <laughs> bring it back. I know what you're like. Um, I know what you are like. Good, good. Well, as our young people are departing, um, just a couple of bits of family news. Um, The first thing is I just want to thank the sound team. Uh, Not all of them. Well, yes, all of them. They're all brilliant. (laughs) But but a few of them got together yesterday uh, to sort out the sound. A number of us have been concerned about the sound the last couple of weeks, and they came and did a sort of deep dive into the stuff behind me, all the wires and the and the things. So I'm very grateful to um, those who came and did that yesterday while we're all uh, at home in our warm homes. You're in the cold church sorting this out. So thank you. Um, just to say that also that there's uh, new sheets at the back. Um, you should be getting it online, but there are some hard copies at the back with all the things you need to be praying for about. Um, I've written a blog, as you may know. I've actually just edited it so it looks a bit cleaner and better. Um, but we put a copies of the blog. If you haven't, if you're not online, we've done a copy of the blog and put it on the table at the back. And um, I'm encouraging you to look at it, not because it's amazing, but because it just sets out where we're at with the with the bishops and with the diocese and with the Church of England. And uh, there's going to be another follow-up blog um, in the not too distant future. But um, do be praying for our bishops, uh, for our church and for our clergy, and here as well at St. Paul's, as we respond. Um, You'll see on the notice sheet that um, we have made a decision as a PCC on behalf of the church family to um, pay our parish share. We're still paying it to the diocese because um, we think that's the right thing to do at the moment. Um, But we're going to pay it through the Oxford Good Shears Trust. Um, It's a a little way of saying to the diocese that we we really want our our money to be used in a godly way and in a wise way. And uh, we're unsure about the direction that you're taking at the moment with the diocese and the teaching that's coming from our bishops. So we're still paying our power share, but we're paying it through the Oxford Good Stewards Trust. And that will begin in the next month or two, um, or three. Um, We're meeting tonight at five o'clock. We're looking at discipleship from the end of Luke chapter nine. um, And um, looking forward to that. And um, I'm going to do something very unusual. I'm going to say, because I didn't ask anyone, is there any other really important notices? I don't like doing this. Good, right. Um, We're going to have our Bible readings in that case. And um, I'm going to hand over first to Kelly and then followed on. Maybe all three of our Bible readers come up and share the lectern because I'm not sure about the other mics. Oh, it's Kelly, not... Oh, whoops. Oh, whoops. Um, well, get your Bibles out. Here comes Kelly. Revelation chapter 8. And we're starting at verse 6, I think it is. Revelation 8, 6, page 
Then the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to sound them. The first angel sounded his trumpet and then came hail and fire mixed with blood and it was hurled down upon the earth. A third of the earth was burned up, a third of the trees were burned up and all the green grass was burned up. The second angel sounded his trumpet and something like a huge mountain all ablaze was thrown into the sea. A third of the sea turned into blood. A third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. The third angel sounded his trumpet, and a great star blazing like a torch fell from the sky on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters turned bitter, and many people died from the waters that had become bitter. The fourth angel sounded his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon and a third of the stars, so that a third of them turned dark. A third of the day was without light, and also a third of the night. As I watched, I heard an eagle that was flying in midair call out in a loud voice, Woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth, because of the trumpet blasts about to be sounded by the other three angels. The fifth angel sounded his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen from the sky to the earth. The star was given the key to the shaft of the abyss, when he opened the abyss, smoke rose from it, like the smoke from a gigantic furnace. The sun and sky were darkened by the smoke from the abyss, and out of the smoke locusts came down upon the earth and were given power like that of scorpions of the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any plant or tree, but only those people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were not given power to kill them, but only to torture them for five months. And the agony they suffered was like that of the sting of a scorpion when it strikes a man. During those days, men will seek death, but will not find it. They will long to die, but death will elude them. The locusts looked like horses uh, prepared for battle. On their heads they wore something like crowns of gold, and their faces resembled human faces. Their hair was like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth. They had breast breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the thundering of many horses and chariots rushing into battle. They had tails and stings like scorpions, and in their tails they had power to torment people for five months. They had as king over them the angel of the abyss, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek Apollyon. The first woe is past. Two other woes are yet to come. The sixth angel sounded his trumpet and I heard a voice coming from the horns of the golden altar that is before God. It said to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. And the four angels who had been kept ready for this very hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. The number of the mounted troops was 200 million. I heard their number. The horses and riders I saw in my vision looked like this. Their breastplates were fiery red, dark blue, and yellow as sulfur. The heads of the horses resembled the heads of lions, and out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and sulfur. A third of mankind was killed by the three plagues of fire, smoke, and sulfur that came out of their mouths. The power of the horses was in their mouths and in their tails, for their tails were like snakes, having heads 
with which they inflict injury. The rest of mankind that were not killed by these plagues still did not repent of the work of their hands. They did not stop worshipping demons and idols of gold, silver, bronze, stone and wood, idols that cannot see or hear or walk. Nor did they repent of their murders, their magic arts, their sexual immorality or their thefts. Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven. He was robed in a cloud with a rainbow above his head. His face was like the sun and his legs were like fiery pillars. He was holding a little scroll which lay open in his hand. He planted his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land and he gave a loud shout like the roar of a lion. When he shouted, the voices of the seven thunders spoke. And when the seven thunders spoke, I was about to write. But I heard a voice from heaven say, seal up what the seven thunders have said and do not write it down. Then the angel I had seen standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven and he swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and all that is in them, the earth and all that is in it, and the sea and all that is in it, and said, there will be no more delay. But in the days when the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet, the mystery of God will be accomplished, just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. Then the voice that I had heard from heaven spoke to me once more. Go take the scroll that lies open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and asked him to give me the little scroll. He said to me, take it and eat it. It will turn your stomach sour, but in your mouth it will be as sweet as honey. I took the little scroll from the angel's hand and ate it. It tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach turned sour. Then I was told, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Brilliant. Thank you so much to our readers. Um, not easy words to read, and did it so well, and uh, we're very grateful. Um, keep the Bible there open, and we'll see what we can do getting through some of that. Probably the most difficult, possibly the most difficult chapters in the Bible, who knows, but probably the most terrifying, maybe. Um, and we don't take these things lightly. We, we pray with the children, but let me pray again. Blessed are those who read the words of these books or hear the words of these books, this book and uh, take it to heart. Lord, we want to take your word to heart that we will grow in confidence that you are on your throne and that you have wonderful things in store for your people. So please bless us as we listen and as we learn today, as we study your word together. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, um, how is your evangelism, your witnessing, how are you bearing up doing it? Um, are you struggling to share your faith with other people? Um, what's it like when you try and turn a conversation um, in the office to, to that, the fact that you went to church on Sunday or um, that um, you've really enjoyed uh, reading a particular book of the Bible this, this month? I mean, how's that going? Um, it is hard, isn't it? And um, I wonder, I'm starting with that because as I've been reading this section of Revelation, I've been enormously encouraged in my personal evangelism and for all sorts of reasons, but particularly um, the role that we're given, the commission that we're given by the Lord to do it, to pass on, to share the joy of the Lord Jesus with others, but also the urgency of the task and the, um, and the time that is running out. Um, but I wonder how that's going, especially when you're feeling a little bit under the cosh 
um, people have been opposing what you're saying um, about your faith, about the Lord Jesus. Um, can you make that leap from talking about church, I go to church, to I trust in Jesus because he is everything. Well, um, this week, you may have spotted on the sheet last week, um, something I was supposed to mention from the pulpit last week, and Revelation as a book could finish at chapter 8, verse 1. <clears throat> In chapters 4 and 5, Jesus pulls back the curtain. Um, so put my um, recap on the screen, please, James. Um, in chapters 4 and 5, Jesus pulls back the curtain and says, Look, the heavenly throne room, encouraging the churches that God is in total control and something they really needed to hear then and it's something that we need to hear now. But there's a problem. There's a problem of sin and suffering and this hardship. What's God going to do about all these things? And all, it's all sort of contained in this scroll. And in chapter 5, no one is found to open it. But wonderfully, um, amongst the tears, suddenly someone is found, Jesus, the Lion of Judah, worthy because he is slain. He's the Lamb who has dealt with sin and death. So the tears can stop, and we can joyfully worship together our Lord and King. And then last week, 6 verse 1 to 8, we see life in the world between uh, Christ's first coming and his second coming. So it's not a future time of turmoil at some point in the future before Jesus, just before he returns, although it's bound to get more intense as Satan struggles for survival. No, as Jesus has remarked himself in Matthew and in Mark, um, these are things that happen today. The stuff that we read about in Revelation 6. Nation will rise against nation, says Jesus. Kingdom against kingdom. There'll be earthquakes in various places, famines. And he says, these are the beginning of birth pangs. So these are to be expected now and in the first century and, ever, and between those times. And 9 to 11, uh, we aren't immune as Christians, verse 9, 11, 9 to 11 in chapter 6. Um, we face the same things, but also we have the added thing of persecution and sometimes death because we trust in Jesus. And um, chapter 6, therefore, is an experience that we see on the ground today. There are wars, there's fighting, there's scarcity, there's disease, and there is a struggle that Christians face, particularly overseas, leading to death. And then verse 12 of chapter 6, judgment day arrives. And it's a terrible description, isn't it? Uh, or a description of terror facing those who've rejected God and his son Jesus. And it ends with verse 17, who can stand? Who can stand the judgment? For we are all sinners. We've all pushed God away. And then at the start of chapter 7, we discover who can stand. It's his people that have been set aside, sealed by his spirit. God's faithful people will stand at the day of judgment. They have built their house on the rock. And when the storm comes in, uh, other houses will fall flat, but our house, because it's God's house, will stand. We shelter under the blood of the Lamb. We've washed our robes, verse 14 of chapter 7, in his blood. And never again, verse 16, will we hunger or thirst. And then 8 verse 1, there's nothing more to say. The seventh seal, silence in heaven. And we could close the book. Because that is that. Amen. Oh, and um, as you see, we don't need much more anymore. We don't need anything more. It's a complete picture of history on the ground. So why do we have chapters 8, 9, and all the way to the end of the book? Why do we have those chapters? What's the point of it all? Well, as we'll be discovering, these following chapters go back again and again to revisit the same things to expand on the same truths um, of these last days between Jesus' first coming and his second coming. And, but each time from a different angle, from a different perspective, to deepen our understanding, to deepen our trust in Jesus and to encourage us to keep going. Um, so today we've got that stuff about being commissioned witnesses to go and tell. It's a bit like a PowerPoint. So it's, it's, we have this truth so one slide of a power, power my first slide, um, right, there we have it, lovely, there's the truth, okay, and there it is, but we go back and start adding things to it, so next slide, 
Um, we've added a bit, mystery reveal. Next slide. Uh, next slide. It's like acetates, isn't it? Next slide. It just things keep building on to create a bigger picture. Next slide. And finally, oh, next slide. The next one. Oh, Kath Johnston. There she is. I don't know why I put that in. It was on my screen, so I put it on. Um, but do you understand the point? So we keep laying on different layers of the same, uh, built on the same truth about these last days. Um, thanks, James. Um, that's exactly what we're doing here in our bit this morning, and the vision it becomes very terrifying. Um, this time, rather than seven seals, it's seven trumpets, and the first four are grouped together and bring disaster, just like the four horsemen in chapter six. And these disasters are mainly on nature, on creation rather than on people. And they're only partial. So do you remember the third, a third of this, a third of that? Um, it could be more, but it isn't. It's been restricted. And it teaches us this is happening in every age. Rumors of wars, earthquakes, volcanoes, and so on. So what we're learning is the world, next slide, is under God's judgment today as we spurn the Lord and as, we, and as the world persecutes his people. So this is the judgment the world experienced today. And it's in creation and it's uh, among the people. And yeah, it is terrifying. And remember, this is not journalistic, investigative journalism. It's impressionism. It's like a painting. It's not, um, you know, chronological facts. It's it's like a, a it's a vision. It's a it's a film. It's a cartoon in a sense. And um, it just tells us a big, it takes a big picture. We, so we don't stare too long at all the details. Do you remember? You're going on a long journey. This is a journey. You're heading for glory um, in Revelation. And if you, you look side, oh, that's nice. That's interesting. Oh, yeah, yeah. But if you stare too long, you veer off the road and crash. Um, so we don't want to do that too much. It's a vision. Um, it's an impressionist painting. It's not investigative journalist type text. And all the language nearly is from the Old Testament, as always, um, as we've been saying for the last few weeks. So we've got Joel here with locusts. We've got Ezekiel, um, about, and that's the coals being scattered um, on, in, in, in verse 5 of chapter 8. The sun darkened. We see that in the Exodus. So it's, it is reality. This is real stuff. But it's not taken literally in that sense. So chapter 8, verse 2 to 5, the picture of heaven that I read at the beginning. Um, seven seals, and just before it, we had this incense of prayer, and then the seven seals. Well, the same here. We have these prayers rising up to heaven, and this triggers the seven trumpets. This triggers the judgment on our world. So he hears our prayers. How long, O Lord? And he sends an answer, and the angel throws down the answer, the fire, onto the world. Does that make sense? And the people of God is a terrible persecution, uh, lots of tribulation. We're not immune, and we have to wait patiently. Do you remember that verse from chapter 1, verse 9? We have to endure in the tribulation and fix our eyes on Jesus. And that's quite hard to relate to in Banbury today because life is fairly comfortable, isn't it? Relatively so. Um, although we've had that notices about the bishops and so on and so forth, and quite often um, suffering does come from the fringes of, of believers, so the, just on the outer courts, but I'll come to that later. But suffering Christians, martyr Christians, persecuted Christians are all about in our world. And they cry out, verse uh, 10 of chapter 6, how long the prayers are heard and therefore God acts. It says therefore, and the trumpets, and he will act. That's a wonderful encouragement. God hears us, and he will act on what he hears. He hears the prayers of his oppressed people, and therefore he subjects the world to judgments in this age. And that's what we have in these two chapters, eight and nine. And I haven't really got time to go into these chapters, um, but we have the imagery to begin with of the... Um, Exodus. So, you mean these plagues, the first few verses, the trumpet blast in verse 6, and we have all these different things, the, the hail, uh, the fire, we have the earth burned up, we have blood in the water, verse 8, uh, living creatures that affects the ships, 
um, we have um, the darkness, we have bitter water. Um, and these are things, some of the things we find in, in the uh, plagues, in the Exodus. So the people reading this would understand. Um, God hears them in the Exodus. He raises up Moses and he inflicts Egypt with these terrible plagues. And in a sim similar way, this is what's happening today. He's heard our prayers and he's inflicting the world. And it's to cause the world to repent. And I'll come to that in a moment. But this is the Lord our God, um, the Lamb that's acting in furious anger. We often think of Jesus in a nighty, you know, sandals, the Lamb, the weak one. But he is the mighty God. And we saw that vision in chapter 1. And he will come and exercise his wrath about a world that's rejected him, on a world that's rejected his people. And when was this? When was all this happening? Well, as I've said, it's, it's today. But it's also, you know, people look, think it's in the past. And for the first century, there were things here that did happen in the past. And some people say, no, it's all in the future. It's all about some future end. Well, there will be bits of it in the future. But actually, it's representing the sufferings of Christians um, and the world throughout the period. So, and if we just turn on our television sets, we'll see that. Um, slightly less graphically, perhaps, uh, slightly more toned down, but the news shows us that we're in the, these days. We have a dictator marching into another country with, with bombs. Uh, we have people abusing other people. We have children be suffering. And famine and the likes. God is angry at the oppression of his people, and he turns his anger onto the world. So those are the trumpets, one to four. And uh, then we... And, um, then we have the next thing. We have the warning in verse 13, and it gets a bit more frightening. Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth, says this angel flying about an uh, eagle um, with this bird's eye view of what's going on. Woe to you, because the second trumpet's about to, uh, the, the fifth angel sounding his trumpet. And um, he saw the star. Verse 1, fallen from the sky to the earth. You might recognize that from the Old Testament, from Job. The star was given the key to the shaft of the abyss. So who's the star? Satan. And he's been given a key. So he's under God's authority, under his sovereignty. And um, verse 2, he opens the abyss, smoke rose from it, a gigantic furnace, and the sun and the sky darkened. It's awful, isn't it? And the smoke and the locusts come apart. And Satan and his forces seem to be let loose. And um, all under Satan's spell. And Jesus says um, the same thing, doesn't he? In Luke 10, he says he saw Satan falling like lightning, uh, like a comet. And we have evil being described, the prince of evil, Satan, and the trumpet blows. And Satan's given this key, and he's under God's authority. And, and that's always the case in Revelation. God is in charge, even when there's evil. And not that God and evil are one. No, of course not. There is no hint that God approves or, of or delights in what Satan does. But what Satan does, even what evil may bring, is under the control of God. He's given the key. And as he opens it, and thank goodness for that, by the way, and as he opens it, there are untold horrors pouring out. And we have this weird locust-like scorpions. You know, it's a grotesque picture. Faces and women's hair and so on. And it's meant to be scary. It's meant to be terrifying. And verse 10, they have a king, Abaddon, or Abaddon, or Apollyon, uh, the destroyer. And uh, of course, that's Satan. The, the, he's leading uh, these demons. And it's taken from the word Apollo. And there's a god called Apollo, false god, with the symbol of a locust. The emperor, Domitian, who is a terrible persecutor of Christians, adopted Apollo, the locust, as his sort of symbol. So they would have understood this sort of, sort of imagery. Anyway, uh, but this is typical of what has been going on. Persecution of God's people and throughout history. Um, but this is impressionism, not investigative journalism. It's not going to be a horror film where the, the villain um, looks all weird, you know, a giant locust with scorpion tail and so on. Um, no, that's just to help us think about the terror of it. 
um, the villain, the, the Satan, it would be more like looking like an emperor or a king or a president, um, a warlord or a destructive political force. That's how Satan's going to do his, wield his influence in our world and does so. And we go on in, in the book and we found out that Babylon is unmasked in many guises, um, not just in supernatural ways. So this political tyranny, godless compromise, the seduction of immorality, all the stuff that the Church of the Revelation are dealing with. Do you remember? They lukewarm and they were getting dragged away by compromise or false teaching and so on. But if you turn down those graphics, um, if you tone them down, things won't look that out of place on our TV screens when we look at the news tonight. So verse 12, uh, verse 12, um, I've told myself to read it, so I'm going to read it. Verse 12 of chapter 9, the first woe is past, two other woes are yet to come. What? Uh, so the first woe was those trumpets one to five, the second woe is the sixth trumpet, more terrifying news, and it really is terrifying. We've got these mounted troops on the side of the great Euphrates River, that's by Babylon. So this is area that's renowned for having forces coming out of it, re wreaking and havoc and being evil. And, and even Rome would be scared of them. And Babylon is where Israel were exiled. So it does symbolize evil and rebellion against God. And verse 15, we have those four angels on the border of Babylon releasing their troops. And the NIV has helped us because there's no million word in, in, in the Greek. But it's 200 million mounted horsemen coming to kill a third of mankind. It really is a shocking scene. And it's saying to us that God is angry, and rightfully so, at the way we've rejected him and the way the world has inflicted pain on his people. Woe. He's angry. Woe on you. And Jesus uses similar language. He says, blessing on you. And Jesus says, woe. Woe on you. Blessing for those who receive me, but woe on those who reject me. God does not take pleasure in those things. He doesn't take pleasure in bringing judgment, anger on the world. He offers salvation to all of us. Come to me, he says. Come and let me bless you. My burden is light. But woe to those who reject, who reject me. And then we have this astonishing conclusion. Verse 20 of chapter 9. The rest of mankind that were not killed by these plagues did not repent. They didn't repent. Despite all the havoc, they didn't repent of the work of their hands. They did not stop worshipping demons and idols and gold, silver, bronze, stone and wood, idols that can't see or hear, nor did they repent of their murders, their magic arts, their sexual immorality or their thefts. You would think that the world facing such catastrophe, where evil's clearly unleashed on the world... Um, political corruption, regime, terrible abuses, children being abused, ISIS, Putin, and so on. You'd think that it was obvious to the world that something was wrong. And they would ask the question instinctively, maybe the God of this world is unhappy with us. Well, you'd think that people would come to their senses and urgently repent, like the people of Nineveh, but they don't. Where is the true and living God? But they don't. Astonishingly, And instead, among these horrors, they, we bemoan all the time. I was reading a news story yesterday that someone was bemoaning, how could people do that to that police officer? Uh, to that, how could those police officers do that? It's dreadful. It was ever thus. We must do this, this, and this to make sure it never happens again. It always will happen again. Among the horrors, society going down the tube, can't we start to brush it under the carpet again. And we see that we have, we're very full of ourselves as society. Look at our progress. Look how we can abandon God and leave him behind. Look at my self-confidence. We can fix anything. And then we turn on our televisions and see that actually we can't. So there's such a disparity there. And Revelation says that people will not repent. And they will harden their hearts as Pharaoh did. So in those plagues, do you remember? Plague one, Pharaoh goes, forget it. Plague two, forget it. Plague three, mm, forget it. Plague four, he doesn't repent. The plagues are there to get him to repent. And finally, plague ten. He says, 
go. But then he reneges and tries to get the people back. Pharaoh's heart was hardened. He will not repent despite what's staring him in the face. And it's the true for our society today. Well, that's chapters 8 and 9. And briefly, chapters 10 and 11, part of the unfolding of the seven trumpets, but now there's this interlude. So the seventh trumpet you'll see is at the beginning of the middle section of chapter 11. So what's going on in between? Well, it's an interlude, and I've given you structure on the sheets. Have a look at that at home. But this interlude's really important, because in both interludes, and in the previous interlude last week, we learn about what's going on with God's people. Satan has been wreaking havoc, the seventh trumpet, but in the middle, the Christians are found to be in exile. The focus is on the church, and John is now personally involved. He's given a scroll. He has to eat it. He's given a measuring rod. He's got to measure. And both those things come from the prophet Ezekiel. Um, did you see that? Do you know Ezekiel? See, that's the thing. We're, we'd know this. We'd be more comfortable with this if we knew our Bibles. And Ezekiel is appropriate because he's speaking to a people in exile. So he's in enemy territory. And G, uh, John's in enemy territory. He's in Patmos writing a letter in prison. We are on enemy territory. We're in the world. Um, and so it's appropriate for us. So people in exile, living in a world where the six trumpets are blasting, where we're surrounded by all this judgment. So what are we going to hear from the Lord? So we've got to exist within these trumpet blasts, within this judgment. What's the Lord saying to us as Christians? What do we do about it? Well, we have three pictures. We have the sweet scroll with a bitter aftertaste in verse 1 to 7. I'll read a little bit of it, but Kelly read it so well, I probably don't need to. Um, he was robed in a cloud with a rainbow above his head, a bit like Jesus. His face was like the sun. His so sort of godly angel, this huge, uh, incredibly powerful angel, the size of a continent, wrapped in a cloud. And like the vision of Jesus in chapter 1, um, he speaks, he roars like a lion. The thunder comes. And does he want him to write it down? No. Um, John gets his pen out, he, his quill, quill. He starts to write down, no, stop, says the angel. Um, you're not going to write it down. And we're not sure why that is. Um, but a good answer that I've heard is that we don't need any more warnings. All this stuff that John's been writing is a warning to us to, to get right with the Lord, warning to the world. But the time has finished. The sixth trumpet's come. The seventh's about to come. The final trumpet. No more warnings. You've had it. The time is now very short. Um, it won't be long. So chapter 15, the destroyer will be destroyed. Um, we get that in chapter 11, actually. Um, the destroyer will be destroyed. Yes, turmoil, but not for long. God's limited it. And the scroll is sweet. It's our message of the gospel. It's our comfort. But it's also bitter because great horrors are around us as well. Um, and that's a good description of the Christian life, isn't it? It's sweet. We have so much privilege, but there's bitterness as we, um, we have to live in this world and, and there's judgment and, and difficulty. Uh, so the scroll is sweet and bitter. Um, the next picture is this measuring rod. And if you know Ezekiel, verse 1 to 3 is very familiar. I was given a reed, a measuring rod, and told, go and measure the temple of God and the altar and count the worshippers there. But exclude the outer court. Do not measure it because it's been given over to the Gentiles. Um, look at the details in your sheet. But there's a measuring of the temple. And Ezekiel helps us because the temple he prophesies about is one that will come because their temple has been taken away. They're in a foreign land. And Ezekiel's temple that he sees is vast. Room for everyone. It becomes a city and a river running through it. And sound familiar? With health and renewal. And it's a wonderful picture of safety and wonder for the Christian. And um, even if the present is difficult, it's a beautiful image of what's ahead. So it helps us hope while we suffer. But unlike Ezekiel, this is partial reality, a picture of God's church. Jesus has come, and he said, I am the temple. 
and he's measuring the people of God. It's just the right amount. Do you remember the 144,000? God knows exactly the right amount of people. He's put his seal on us, and it's a multitude that no one can count. And our hope is that we're part of God's church, his temple. We're in the inner sanctuary, it says in verse 1 to 3, the inner bit with God. Then we've got the strict border, and then we have the outer bit, just beyond our borders. And that's a reality for the churches in Asia Minor in chapter 2 and 3. You know, they've got, even people within their congregations don't believe the gospel, taking them away from the gospel. And today, as we measure out the temple, we are encouraged because we want to measure and see that we are included in God's people. Do we measure the denomination, the Church of England? No. We'll find that some in the Church of England are on the outer courts. They're not in the people of God. They're taking us away with false teaching. Um, and they'll be trampled by the nations and given over to the pagan culture. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? The people in the outer court will be taken away by the pagan culture around them. And we do see people in the church following the pagan message. How long have I got? Oh, I've run out of time. Then we've got two witnesses. Verse 4. What's going on here? These weird witnesses. Um... Two olive trees, two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone tries to harm them, fire comes from their mouths. What's going on there? But it's a picture, isn't it? It's just images. Oil, um, olive trees are helpful because olive trees provide oil for lamps. So it's like a continual source of, of oil for the lamps. And two olive trees, two witnesses, we have two witnesses in the Old Testament that are needed to proclaim the praises of him who brought us out of darkness into his wonderful light. Um, legally, two witnesses were required. That was required on Jesus' trial. And Zechariah 2, and four, 2 to 4, we see a faithful remnant in Zerubbabel and Joshua. Zerubbabel was king and Joshua was priest. Ooh, kings and priests are the two witnesses. Uh, we are called out to be kingdom of priests. Do you remember? Revelation chapter 1, Revelation chapter 5. And what do we have to do? Well, John's given a scroll, and now the witnesses are told to go and witness. And he's used faithful pictures. So we have Zerubbabel, who are faithful, and Joshua, who is faithful. We have Moses and Elijah, who are faithful. Um, that's what it's going on about, with power to shut up the sky and so on. Why are these different people? Why, well, the writer is just giving us different examples of faithful witness over the time. And um, God's going to raise up more of them in the future, faithful witnesses, until the seventh trumpet's blast. And then we read on in chapter 11, I haven't got time, this terrible vision of the gospel not being well received, and that's what we know. You know, we, we share and people don't receive it, and in some countries, gospel teachers are killed, and we see these dead bodies lying in the streets. But wonderfully... Those bodies are raised. There's a three and a half days, which is a short time now. They'll be raised and to glory while they leave the burning world behind. So there's a vindication of God's people. And that's a great comfort to us as we consider these things, that we're told to go and witness while we wait. We're sent out with the scroll, with the message of Jesus. And it will be hard, but we've been given power to do it. Um, these witnesses are given power, oil, to get on and do this. And, um, and they will be experiencing hardship, as my slide says, um, in power, but it will be painful. It will be painful. And um, let's finish, but let's skip ahead to verse 14 of chapter 11. The second woe has passed, the third woe is coming. Oh, no, not another woe. Um, can't bear it. Um, we're expecting terrible evil, aren't we? But we get a surprise. The seventh angel blows his trumpet, and there's a loud shout this time. So before it was silence in heaven, now there's a loud shout. Fantastic. And verse 15, the seventh angel, loud voice in heaven, and look at what they say. The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever. Isn't that brilliant? The end of Satan's dominion on earth has come. 
His evil reeking of havoc has finished, and now the Lord is on his throne, and the kingdom of his world um, has come. And verse 16, the 24 elders, remember them, seated on the thrones, fell on their faces and worshipped. We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was, because you have taken the great power and begun to reign. Notice the difference before last time? We were reading who was and is and is to come. He was still due to come, but now we have a vision of the Christ who has arrived. Everything is going to be all right. So let's pray as he tells us and challenges us and encourages us to hold on. Hold on. The Lord is coming. He does hear our prayers. He will avenge. He will re repay and afflict those who've afflicted you. There will be justice. Our loving God, we thank you for this vision of heaven. We don't understand it all, but we thank you for helping us to grasp some of it, that you, amongst the turmoil, that there is judgment today on sin, as the New Testament attests. But amongst that, in these arid places, you've put us, your people, to witness to bring people back to you in repentance and faith. So please empower us, please give us endurance and send us in the power of your name to witness while we wait for the coming of our King. In Jesus' name, amen. Now that's the only time we're going to attempt four chapters in one Sunday. So don't worry for next time. I think we're going to sing, are we all going to, yeah, we're going to sing. So, I'm going to invite the group up. And, oh, have I got any more slides? Or is that later? Oh, yeah, we're going to do the statement of faith. Forget that. So let's sing. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. Let's stand.
take a seat, and Ian's going to lead us in some prayer. Let's just take a moment to focus on the one in the throne room of heaven to whom we address our prayers and petitions. How great you are, O Sovereign Lord, majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, working wonders. There is none like you. No one can touch my heart like you do. O oh Lord God, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and obey his commands, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to the prayers of your people. Lord, may our continuing consideration of these chapters in Revelation give us fresh glimpses of your greatness as you draw back the curtain, as it were, and all that you have done and are still doing, grant that we may capture deeper insights into all of your glory, that it might give rise in us to a symphony of praise and adoration to honor your great name. Keep us faithful, Lord, to our high calling as saints, priests, and kings, so that Despite concerted opposition in the world, we may have the calm assurance that it will all be right. That God's people will be vindicated and the promise of the crown of life awaits those who overcome with the right to sit with him on that great throne. Almighty God, we ask for much wisdom grace and discernment for our denomination at this crucial time, that those contending for the truth of your word may be heard above the clamor for change and compromise. May they stand firm in one mind and spirit striving for the faith of the gospel. We pray that the fat, profound dismay of evangelicals across the country and across the world about the recent proposals of the bishops will highlight the unsustainability of the proposals as a way forward. We pray for courage and conviction for those debating the issues at General Synod next week, that there would be a genuine seeking after divine counsel with gracious, prayerful consideration of the matters. And we pray that this will lead to a clear affirmation of the church's established long-held commitment to marriage and that church doctrine and teaching on discipleship and se sexual ethics would not be undermined in any way. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we ask your blessing on our mission partner, Ruth McKee, in her work with Latin Link in Peru. We give thanks for Ruth's protection and that of the students at Shalom during the political unrest which erupted in December. We thank you for the successful completion of the school year and for the graduation of four students just before Christmas. We ask that you would go before Ruth during the current school summer break as she continues the therapy group, the MMI clinic, and the home visits to Shalom families. We we'll pray too for her trip to Bolivia next month for the Latin Link International Meetings. Thank you, Lord, for the multifaceted nature and character of your church. In the face of opposition, Lord, as your witnesses, grant us boldness, courage, and sensitivity that with the empowering of the sword of the Spirit, like Ruth and her colleagues, we will effectively engage in the spiritual warfare of sharing God's work and his truth with all those we meet. 
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful Lord, we bring before your throne of grace those who have recently been bereaved and those who are unwell in mind and body. Draw near to them all, we pray, and bring comfort and healing to each one. In particular, we pray for the families of the worshippers killed in the attack on the synagogue in Jerusalem on Friday and those of the Palestinians killed the previous day. We pray too for the Scottish firefighters seriously injured in the major fire at the former department store in Edinburgh. Bring comfort, O Lord, to the family of Barry Martin, who died yesterday from the injuries he sustained while attending the fire. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious Lord, <clears throat> we bring before you our Vicar Dan and the leadership team at St Paul's in all the key decisions that they have to take in the care and support of all our church family and for the repairs and refurbishment here at Warwick Road and at the church centre in Prescott Avenue. Grant wisdom and discernment, we pray, and may each of us give them the prayerful and practical support they need as, the under, as they undertake their God-given role as shepherds of your people. And gracious Lord, we pray that the grant application currently being submitted to the Diocesan Development Fund to resource the proposed new full-time minister in the parish will be favorably received and actioned speedily. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Great God of wonders, all thy ways are matchless, godlike, and divine. But the fair glories of thy grace, more godlike and unrivaled, shine. Oh, may this wondrous, matchless grace, this godlike miracle of love, fill the whole earth with grateful praise as now it fills the choirs above. Who is a pardoning God like thee? Or who has grace so rich and free? Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent and worthy of praise, think on these things. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And we conclude our prayers by saying together the prayer that Jesus taught his friends. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Well, we are the witnessing church, and the task is urgent. And we go f forth in faith. And as we do so, we do feel weak. Uh, we are aware of the pain around us. And we need more and more to know God's grace in our lives. And yet, in that weakness, in that reality, we have that in our hearts, a song of triumph ringing out uh, that we rest on him. And in his name we go. What a commission. We go in his name. So we're going to stand and sing our final song together. We rest in thee.
we remain standing and we're going to say these words together from chapter 11. Great and marvellous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the ages. Who will not fear you, O Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for you righteous acts have been revealed. Amen. Do you take a seat. Um, I've just noticed that the print on the handout today is rather small, so we'll try and remedy that at some point. But all, the, all, the, all these things will be on the resources page of the website, and um, the previous ones are, or if you want hard copies of the previous ones, they're on the table here. Let's pray. We rest in thee, we rest on thee. Lord, we thank you that you have our backs, that you are our shield and our defender. Lord, that you will empower us and send us um, with the help of your spirit to be witnesses to the glory of Jesus. So go with us now into this week, uh, to our offices, to our homes, to our neighborhoods, uh, to be your representatives in an arid country, um, to be your voice your voice pieces, your hands and feet um, in a world that's lost its way. May we be pointing people to your glorious and reigning and victorious son. And in Jesus' name, amen. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the one and only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forever. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.